And so I really feel confident that what Holy Spirit wants to uh, express to you this morning is from the Father's heart. Um, and I want to start, we're going to have a lot of scripture, so we'll see how that goes. I might paraphrase some of them for time's sake, I don't know. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through 18. I'm not going to preach on suffering, by, by the way, so relax, even though I know what verse 17 says. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not, somebody say not, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So I just want to start by saying there is an emphasis, I believe, in what Holy Spirit is trying to do with the body to where he's bringing us to a place in the spirit where we live and move and have our being and we're fully consciously aware of Holy Spirit every moment. It's not a chore. It's not a trial. It's not designed to be, oh, I've got to think about God all the time. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about have you ever been in love? Puppy love, some people call it when you're younger. I remember having that, and you just can't stop thinking about her. What is this, mom and dad? And they just laugh at you. Puppy love. I'm like, puppy love? This is real. And you carry that, and you think about that person all the time, and it's not a chore. See, that's what we got to get through, through to the body, is they think they've got to do this and do this and do this to have that relationship and please Him. But the reality is, the Lord is not asking you to come and do a bunch of things. He's asking you to create a place in your life where He can rest and where He can be with you and you can be in love and He can be in love. And then it just becomes this big love thing, right? I preached on that a long time ago. I remember John 17, how we are in the dance of the Trinity. We're moving in and out of Him. He's moving in and out of us. This is a supernatural spiritual reality that if Christians don't begin to engage in, they're going to be on the outside looking in as Father moves his bride deeper into his heart. And this is not a judgment thing or a condemning thing if that's not where you are. It's a wonderful, beautiful invitation from Holy Spirit to say, come up higher. Come deeper. Come into a place that you've not been yet. The places you have been may have even been good. But he's saying come into a place to where your vision becomes fixed on the things that are not seen. So I find that that's the problem with a lot of people when I talk about this loving, intimate relationship with Holy Spirit and they interpret it through the natural things they're seeing. They interpret it through what they have lived through to what they see in society, what they see in culture. But the reality of it is you cannot interpret it through that. There is a place where Father wants you to be what is not seen. And suddenly you see what was not seen. You begin to see in the spirit. You begin to see it from the heavenly realm. You begin to see from deep inside of Father's heart. Because outside of that place, which is where much of the body of Christ is existing right now, is not the place you want to be as Father moves his bride further and further into his heart. And so I, this is an invitation this morning. If you're not in this place, it's not a... You're bad, go do these things for God. This is, oh, you have no idea yet how much you are loved. You have no idea yet how much he wants to fill you with him. How much he wants you to walk with him and talk with him and express him. He wants to be with you. This place is above ministry. This place is above the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as wonderful and valuable as they are. And we have got to come up and live out of that source and not live out of a lower place that is mixed with everything we see. And we are trying to interpret things that are supposed to be in the unseen, but we're interpreting them through the whole wrong lens. So allow Holy Spirit to draw you into that place. So that was 2 Corinthians 4. I want to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, I want you to remember that word as we move on, our house, 
is torn down. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan. If you go look up the uh, original word for that, if you look up the meaning of this groaning and this longing he's talking about, it is so much deeper than what you understand. It is so much deeper than what we have experienced. He wants there to be a longing and a groaning within us to be clothed with his glory. And if anything short of that, there is something that we need to allow Holy Spirit to bring correction. But what a wonderful correction. Hey, go, go fall more in love. What kind of discipline or punishment is that? Go fall in love and be blessed and enjoy him and learn that he's not mad at you for anything. Does he want to correct you? Yeah, because he loves you and he wants you deeper and deeper in his heart. He wants you to live out of that place. I suppose I should finish the verse. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And as much as we having put it on will not be found naked. Is there, ask yourself, is there a groaning within you? Is there a longing to be clothed more and more with his glory? To be clothed more and more with Christ? To know him more and more? Is there a holy, righteous dissatisfaction within you for where you might currently be? Is it there? There's nothing wrong with that. That's a righteous thing to be dissatisfied with where you might be in your relationship with the Lord because it's that dissatisfaction that can cause you to step into the invitation to go into the unseen and to begin to see things as he sees them. My friend Louis in the back, he has taught me a little bit about this and that we need to see him as the one who is the eternal lover. We need to see him as the one who is the lover of our soul. How you can't perceive that in the natural. You can't. You've got to come into him. Burrow your way into the Father's heart. That's what he's speaking to me right now. Burrow your way into the Father's heart. Come deeper and deeper and your sight will begin to be changed. You don't have to do anything except abide in him. And just be in him. But if you will commit to that. But I know it's hard because we start, oh, Greg, you told me I should spend an hour sitting in stillness just thinking about nothing but the Lord. No prayer, no Bible reading in that moment. I get it. It's not easy. I've gone through that process of learning to be with him with no expectation other than you're going to receive love and he's going to receive it. And as that love goes back and forth, there is transformation within you. I promise you there's a lot of people because I've experienced this sitting in this room right now who need that kind of transformation. And you're reaching out for things to provide it and then frustrated why you're not changed. <laughs> Right? You have to go on the inward journey with Father. That is the place <laughs> where you will be transformed. It is a work of the flesh and a work of the law that causes you to think, if I do more, if I reach out more, if I do this ministry, if I help this person, all those things are good. But the transformation comes deep within the Father's heart and nowhere else. That is where the transformation will happen. So it's an invitation right now. For you, come into the unseen. Take a step out by faith and begin to engage Holy Spirit in whole new ways. And he's going to take you there. So let's look at um, Hebrews 11. Verse 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. So you guys know Abraham. He goes out to receive this inheritance. And his inheritance is as many as the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea. We'll read that in a second. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Huh. 
When you step deeper, you're not going to know where you're going. I'm going to bring up Louie again. Louie talked about the things that he's come into that he just fumbled around in the dark, right? Like a blind man. But the desire, the groaning, and the longing drove him to go, even though he didn't know where he was going. Abraham didn't know where he was going. He had no idea, but he knew there was an inheritance that God had given him. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Remember that. Fellow heirs of that same promise. Now, here it is. This is what I love. Here, here's what's in his heart. Here's where the groaning and the longing is. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Even way back then, and this, Abraham, the father of our faith, was longing and groaning for something more than he saw. He was in the physical land, living in tents, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't what his heart desired. There was a higher thing that his heart desired, and the thing that his heart desired was the unseen, was the city that God would build within us, was the, was the bride of Christ that he was going to bring together. He's seeing something that he wanted that goes beyond anything in the natural that he was looking at. And I'm not trivializing the importance of land or inheritance. God gives us those things in the earth. He works through that. He has throughout history. But Abraham, who started this whole thing, by the way, his heart was, I want to go where I don't know because I am longing and looking for something beyond what I have seen in the natural. He began to get a glimpse of something in the spirit and that moved his heart towards it. So the challenge for us is, are we willing to go where we don't know? <laughs> are we willing to take that step of faith into the unknown? Really what you're doing is taking a step of faith into a deeper amount of love than you've experienced and a greater realization of your own identity. That's where you're going. So there's nothing to be scared of. It's something to be excited about, right? But your flesh is going to fight you? Sure. But you know what? You have the victory in him if you will surrender to the process. Surrender to the process that he is wanting to do by drawing you deeper into his heart. So I want you to look at Revelation chapter 21. I'll get there eventually. Oh, darn it. I thought it was in the middle. Oh, that's Psalms. <laughs> I'm going to find some way to make fun of you in front of everybody before this is over. So far, I've esteemed you, brother. Now it's going to be what? I got, I got some stuff. We live together. We all got dirt on one another, right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to be careful with this scripture because I'm not trying to take anything away from what you might believe the interpretation of this scripture is. That's not my intent to come and argue theology. But I believe with all my heart that the Lord gives us multiple layers and application of scripture. He will give you a physical reality. He will give you a spiritual reality. He'll give you this relational reality all through uh, scripture. That's how you see it. So Revelation chapter 21, remember what Abraham was looking for. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. A bride. Don't we, are, are we not the bride? Okay. If you believe that is a physical city that comes down, that's fine. I don't really know. What I do know is just what Holy Spirit reveals to me personally, and I leave the left, rest alone to where he'll reveal it later or whatever. So here's what I believe he is saying is all the way back from Abraham, the longing and the groaning for something unseen, for a building not made with hands, not made with our hands, but a building whose architect and builder is God himself. 
And I believe that is a picture that God is giving us here of a holy city. What is a city but a collection of dwelling places? So we each are a part of that. And as we were born from above, as the Bible says, it's not, it, the, the, my understanding is the best interpretation of born again is born from above, born from heaven. So I see a people that are born from heaven. I see a people right here who are born out of heaven. But the question is, are you living in the fullness of it? Are you living in the reality of what he has gifted you with? Are you living in the reality of the gift of salvation that he has given us? Are you living in the reality that there has been a Holy Spirit given as a deposit for you to walk in, to move in, to live in? Are we living in that reality? Is it a conscious awareness that you have as you go through your day? This only comes by cultivating relationship with the Lord. This comes by you doing a whole lot of nothing except sitting with him and surrendering. Not coming with blah, 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 blah. You know, if you've got to get that out for 10 minutes before you can be still with the Lord, please do. But I'm telling you, if you will lay those things down and just begin to become the house that he wants to dwell in. Become that. Because that is what he is looking for. He is looking for a people who will be a holy city, who will be a dwelling place, will be a bride that will come into perfect union with him. And the reality is you're already there in the spirit. Some of you just don't know it yet. <laughs> and it's the battle of the mind, right, to come into conscious awareness of the reality that already exists in you. So I'm not really telling you to go get it. I'm telling you to come and realize and live in what you already have. So don't think you don't have all of this. The kingdom of heaven is within. You know how big heaven is and it's in you? What does that mean about you? Who are you if you can contain heaven? Just something to think about. Mm. So, more Bible. Second Samuel. I think chapter 7, if I remember. Hmm. Yeah, 2 Samuel. This is after David brought the ark, the presence of God, back to Jerusalem. And they're celebrating and they're living a, a wonderful life in the tent of meeting, but I want you to follow. We're talking about building a house. We're talking about being a holy city for him to inhabit. Now, it came about when the king, that's David, lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies. So we see David, who's been through all these battles and all these things he dealt with with Saul, et cetera, et cetera. You know the story, or if you don't, go read it later. We see that he has now been given rest on every side. And he is now living in this house, as it goes on to say, of cedar. And cedar represents strength. It represents excellence. It represents beauty. It represents the best. And it also represents royalty. So I want you to remember that as I read the rest of this. So he gives him rest on every side. So David has been given a house with rest. The king said to Nathan, Nathan was the prophet, see now, this is David talking, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark, God's presence, dwells within tent curtains. I just thought it was interesting about what Abraham said about they were dwelling in tents. I, I'm not sure if there's a direct correlation there, but it got my attention. Nathan said to the, or cedar, but the ark dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. Man, did the Lord ever blast me? This is a rabbit trail, and this will be the only one. I was so struggling with, I've got all this stuff, God, you're doing all this stuff in me. You're putting all this stuff in my heart and mind, and I'm so terrified of making a misstep. 
I'm like, Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to do the wrong thing. I feel like you're getting ready to launch us into something new, launch me into something new. And I was afraid. And he gave me that scripture and it just brought me to tears the other day when I was reading it, where he, David was so full of the Lord that the prophet said, do all that is in your mind. Do it. Everything. He didn't say do a little bit, compartmentalize, figure out which part of you is hearing from God and which part. He didn't say any of that. David was so on to the Father's heart that Nathan recognized that and said, do everything that's in your mind. I'm not quite ready to do everything that's in my mind <laughs> because my mind still needs a lot of renewal. But that was, that was such a blessing to me. And the Father was like, I'm with you, full of me. Just keep your eyes on me and just do what's in your heart and mind. And if you misstep, so what? So what? He's not mad. He's glad. <laughs> he wants to just lift you back up, put his arms around you and hug you and, and walk you in a corrective direction. That's wonderful. You know what that's an invitation into? More love. Anybody want more love? Yes. You need more love. I mean, that is what he's calling us to, right? So David, in his heart, had been given a house from God, built of cedar. And now, what he is saying is, God's given me rest. How do I give him a place of rest? How do I create a place for him? Why is God intense? He's saying, I want to build the kind of place he's given me. I want to give that to him. I want to be the resting place. I want to be the new city in Revelation 21 that is coming down out of heaven for Christ to inhabit. That's in the heart of a lot of these Old Testament guys. They are seeing things of a coming age that we now live in on this side of the cross. You can have it all. He wants you to come into it. He wants you to reside in him. He wants you to create a place for him. I'm telling you, man, you guys know this. I've been in church a long time, and so have most of you. I have seen us try to create everything but a place for him to rest. I've seen us create ministries and go do things, and some good things will come out of it. It's not... But when are we... When David's like doing all this wonderful stuff, governing Israel, being the king. He's been given rest. But he says, what about God? Where's his place of rest? Where's his house? So we need to be that house for him to indwell so he can come and have his rest within us. He wants to dwell in us as much as we want to dwell in him. That's why we are created. Your ministry is great. Your doo-doo list might be good or it might be doo-doo. I don't know. But I'm telling you, you have got to get to a place where the number one thing is in your life is I am creating a habitation for the Lord inside of me. It's not about a church. I love church. It's not about your ministry. And your ministry may be wonderful and anointed. That needs to come down. It's not about your gifts. Gifts are great. They're irrevocable. Use them. Enjoy them. But from a perspective and a posture they, those things have to be beneath. I am building, I am cultivating a life with the Father that is going to bring a place of rest for him. What does he want it to look like? What does he want to inhabit? So how do we do this? All I can tell you about my journey, and then uh, we'll look at something more important, which is the Bible. My journey was many, many years ago, and I have not, I have not always been consistent in this journey. So... There's times where I've disengaged for a while, re-engaged. Um, I'm just like anybody else. But my journey was the Lord called me to just start to learn to be still with him. It's the first step. We have so much noise, distraction, this and that, right? Be still with him. But Lord, I need to ask you, I know, can you do this and that? Shut up. <laughs> Zip it, you know. <laughs> they do. I think that's hilarious. People do that. It's got to come underneath the number one thing. Your focus, your mind, I guarantee you, needs to be me and him. I have a resting place in him. Now he has a resting place in me. And all the ministry and all the gifts are great. And they're down here. And you grab a tool out of here, a gift and that, and you use it. And that's wonderful. But all the while up here, number one is you are dwelling in him and he is dwelling in you. Don't forget that. Whatever you're doing that's good works, keep doing it. I'm not telling you not to, but keep the perspective in your heart. 
Because if we don't do that, we will be derailed. We will be burnt out. We will be disappointed. We will be hurt which is some of the reason that so many people are disengaging from that intimate relationship. They're projecting their church hurt on God. But you wouldn't project your church hurt on God if you were hidden in his heart. And that's all, and that's what you knew. You would walk in a place above that, a place above offense, a place where you don't get angry anytime somebody pokes your bear, (laughs) where you live in a place where you can just love because it is a dance with the Trinity that is going rolling over in your heart. So how do we do this? We'll look at a couple verses and then we'll close. Book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Gone are the days where you can preach Have a comfortable pause while you listen to the pages turn. (laughs) 38 through 42. Mm. Oh, I mean, you guys all know this. I've talked about this before. Martha and Mary. Now, as they were traveling along, he, meaning Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. When the Lord shows up, sit at his feet and listen to his word. When Jesus walks into the room, I'm not saying there isn't a time to come together and do the chores, but when he walks in, what are we doing (laughs) when we are not seated at his feet? listening to his word, adoring him and having union with him. Instead, we want to run around and do this and do that and build our own kingdoms. And the Lord is like, just come, live in me, and I'll produce so much out of you, you won't believe it. So that's what happened here. I'll put my glasses back on and read the rest. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. Man, I don't, I don't talk to God like that. That's, uh, I mean, he is, my, he is the lover of my soul, but he is also my father. I mean, you don't talk to my father like that. So she's really, woo. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're so worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary for Mary. For Mary has chosen the good part. I love this phrase. Which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus, a lot of people don't read that into that. I believe Jesus rebuked Martha. He said, it, you, don't you dare try to take this away. Don't you dare try to distract from this. Don't you dare come and say, I'm sitting at his feet. Well, no, you need to come over and do this. And you need to come over and do that. What are we doing when we do that? You're pulling people out of the heart of the Father and telling them to go get back into works. Again, all the things that need done, let's do it. Let's come together and many hands make light work and all that. I'm for it. I'm not disqualifying that. We don't just want to sit out in the grass with nothing. I'm not going that far. (laughs) But we have got to sit at his feet. So the question I have is, are you sitting at his feet? When you sense his presence, how do you respond to that? Something the Lord showed me a long time ago is, if you feel even a whisper of his presence, grab it and milk it like it's everything. Honor that presence. Show him in that moment that you're the lover of my soul. You're the one I want. You're the one that I want to give my attention to. And many times as you do that, you can begin to see that expand. And the presence of the Lord can just envelop you and you can learn better how to walk in that day to day. So this is how, this is one of the ways in which we cultivate this dwelling place for God, this building that Abraham longed for. This is one of the ways we cultivate that is when we sense his presence. When he walks into the room, I'm sure when Jesus was not sitting in the living room like that, that Mary did chores. It wasn't like she never helped, but she sensed. Because he was her priority. The ministry, the to-do list, still important, but it's down here. And when the king walks into the room, how uh, dare I not sit at his feet? 
He's come to transform me. He's come to draw me deeper into the Father's heart. He's come to love on me. He's come to correct me. He's come to guide my life and fill me up with his Holy Spirit. Why would I say, come on, let's go do something else in that moment? So I want to encourage you that when you feel the whisper, you know what I'm saying? Just that little whisper. I feel that you go across your heart. Don't just say, oh, that's neat, God, and go on. If you can, grab that thing. And milk it for everything it's worth because what you give value to is going to increase. If you will give that kind of value to his presence, as you walk in that, you will see his presence increase. You will find a greater depth in your prayer time. You will find an ability to sit in stillness with the Lord and let those distractions melt away and come into his heart. This is one of the ways to build that house within you. Almost done. Oh, this one's good. Stay in Luke. Don't hear any pages turning, so I'm just going to go. Chapter 7, verse 36 through 39. I'm on the wrong page. That's not chapter 7. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Want to know how to cultivate a life? to build a house for the Lord. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Here it is again. Jesus walks into the room. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And I know most of you have understood this. What's normally been said is that was probably a year's wage that she brought. She brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet. Talk about a humble heart. She wasn't even going to go in front of him. She's like, ah, Lord, I just, I'm going to come behind you. I think that's fascinating. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. That's how you cultivate and build a house for the Lord to dwell in. That kind of posture is how you approach the Lord. Again, she recognized Jesus is in the room. If you go on to read, you know, the Pharisees didn't like what she was doing and rebuked her. But she didn't care. Just like Mary didn't care about what her sister Martha said, she didn't care. She's like, the king is here. What else am I supposed to do but pour everything out upon him, but kneel at his feet and weep and wipe his feet with tears? That's the kind of posture towards your relationship with Christ that is necessary to build the house that he wants to dwell in. Last one, John chapter 15. You guys know this. One of my faves. So Jesus says in red letters, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Now listen to verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Abiding is akin to the word abode, which is another word for house. What he is saying, take up residence in me. I've created a place of rest. Through the cross, he created a place for you to be. But he says, You are in me and I in you. He is also looking for a place to rest in you. He's also looking for the building that he can come and inhabit, and that's you and I. And if we will live our lives abiding in the vine, if we'll live our lives like that where I am resting in him and he is resting in me and we have the dance of Holy Spirit and that is the reality of your life. And it is only possible in my experience through taking all these idols of ministry and to-dos, casting them down and doing like the two women we saw and putting 
themselves at the feet of Jesus, listening, crying, washing his feet. What a humble picture. And he esteemed her, and he esteemed Mary, and even rebuked someone he loved, Martha. He said, you're not taking this away. Because Jesus like, this is my thing. This is what I died for. You're going to take it away and go do dishes right now? Come on. Martha should have come and sat with her. And Martha represents a lot of us. And until we learn to sit with the Lord and be still and do it for my experiences, elongated periods of time, your path might be different than mine. But all I have to tell you is when I started learning to sit with the Lord in quiet and just focus my love and attention on him for an hour, got to the point where it could be three or four hours straight. That's after it. That's not day one for me, okay? Don't, don't get that idea. But just to begin to cultivate his house within you. Amen? All right. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you that you've created a resting place for us, and you desire a resting place for yourself within us. Father, help us to cultivate our lives in such a way that we would be abiding. You would be our abode, and we would be your abode. Surrender, surrender, surrender. Surrender to what? Surrender to love. It's not easy. But go through the process. Look at these examples in Scripture and give yourself over to him.